Welcome to yet another episode of The Ancient Paths. I'm your temporary host, Matt Weinstock. I'm a deacon at Christ Presbyterian Church, filling in for Jason Wallace. And before we get started with our topic this evening, I would just like to invite you to worship with us. If you're in the Salt Lake Valley area, you can meet us at Christ Presbyterian Church at 8630 West, 2700 South. That's in South Salt Lake. We have uh, worship services on the Lord's Day, morning service at 11 a.m. and evening service at 5.30 p.m. If you live in the Logan or Cache Valley area, we have a mission work which meets up there at the Faith and Fellowship Center. It's very close to Utah State University. It's, the address is 1315 East, 700 North in Logan. And if you'd like more information about that, you can send us an email. They meet every Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. If you live in the Ogden area, there's some exciting developments going on. There's actually a, um, a new Presbyterian church in town, Berean Presbyterian Church. Uh, it's a congregation that is seeking unity with the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, our denomination. They meet at 3350 South Harrison Boulevard on Sunday mornings at a facility, facility that they're renting at 9 a.m. And if you'd like more information about them, you could send an send a inquiry to our email address and I will pass along your questions to Pastor Eggleston of Brian Presbyterian Church. Also, we host a Bible study at that same facility, um, which is graciously provided by Brian Presbyterian Church, on Friday nights at 645, 3350 South Harrison Boulevard. So if you're in the Ogden area, I would encourage you to visit with us. If you're in Salt Lake, Ogden, or in the Logan Cache Valley area, we have, we have something for you, and we would encourage you to, to meet with us. Well, as if, you've, if you've watched the program for any period of time, you'll notice that for the past about year and a half, Pastor Wallace has, has hosted this show and has, has discussed a, a myriad of different topics and has had a, a variety of different guests on the show. But if you pay attention, you'll notice that one of the key features of every episode is the emphasis put upon the centrality of the scriptures in the Christian life. This is something that Pastor Wallace has emphasized in every episode, even, even if it's just subtly emphasized. And as I've hosted these past three episodes, it's something that I have also focused on. In the first episode that we did, we had seminary student Sam Amati, who is pursuing his master's degree at Southern Theological Seminary. We had him on and we had him to uh, discuss with us the importance of the Protestant Reformation and how Reformation in general, as it takes place throughout the history of the church, either in the 16th century or perhaps even back in the Old Testament during the, the reign of King Josiah, which is an example we brought up where he discovered the Book of the Covenant in the temple and saw that the people had departed from it, that the scriptures are central in keeping the church in God's commandments. As soon as they depart or ignore the scriptures, people fall into darkness. And when they are recovered, people come back to an understanding of God's will. In the second episode that, that I did, we talked about the importance of the Old Testament to the Christian. And just this last week, we had the privilege of having on the program Dr. James White of Alpha and Omega Ministries to talk about textual criticism and the fact that that discipline uh, allows us to, to test the, ta the, the claims of Scripture where God tells us that He will preserve His Word. And textual criticism as a science attests to God's claims, that He has preserved His Word for us, that we can have confidence that we know what He has said to us and He has revealed in the past. So we, we've put this emphasis on the centrality of the Scriptures, and we stand as a congregation, the, as Christ Presbyterian Church, on the teachings of the Reformation, on the teachings of men like Martin Luther and, and John Calvin and, and Zwingli and others, who emphasized at this time when the church had fallen into such darkness that the scriptures are central to our life, that we need to go to the scriptures for all of our questions of faith and practice in this life, and that we need to stand upon those claims, and that we, we share with men of the past a high view of the text of scripture, its inspiration, its authority, and so forth. And we, we, would, we would echo um, Timothy, or, or Paul, as he's speaking to young Timothy in 2 Timothy, as he's encouraging Timothy on to his pastoral duties, Paul says there, 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, You, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from a childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped to every good work. So that word there, inspired, it's a, it, the Greek term theopneustos, which means literally God breathed. So when the, when the translation talks about the, the scriptures being inspired by God, what they're saying, if we were to translate literally, is that the scriptures are God breathed. They proceed from God's own mouth. They are his own words. And this is why that they are able to make a man wise unto salvation. This is why that they are profitable for, for doctrine, for teaching, and for reproof, and for correction, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped. It's because they're God's own, God's own words. And so we stand with a multitude of evangelicals who proclaim the highest view of the inspiration, the highest view of inerrancy, the highest view of authority of scriptures. And I'm glad that, that many of our compatriots in, in other organizations and denominations and fellowships and so forth agree with us that the scriptures are to guide us in all of our lives. But the thing is, the thing that, that I've noticed and the thing that others have picked up on as well is even even though many evangelicals will hold their Bibles and they will proclaim to the world that they believe that this is the inspired Word of God and it, they take it seriously, in all practical purposes, they deny that high view of Scripture by the way they handle Scripture. Because many people treat the Bible like a magazine. They flip it open over breakfast and they read a handful of verses and they feel spiritual for the day and they put it back down. Now, is this how we are to approach the Scriptures? If we truly believe that this book is God speaking to us, that he has revealed something to his people which is important for us, should we take it seriously when we read it? And this is the topic of tonight's episode. I'd like to discuss some of the ways in which we should read our Bible. Some very basic things, some things that, that surely will be old hat for many of our viewers, but some things that are so important and crucial, so simple and yet so overlooked that, they, that the, the ignorance to these basic principles has done damage within the evangelical church. So we know that the Bible is sufficient, uh, that it does provide us a, a insight into how we are to be saved, as it says in 2 Timothy 3:14 through 17, that, that it is profitable for doctrine and for teaching and for reproof and for training and so forth, that we could be thoroughly equipped. And yet that, that, that takes something to get to that point. Someone doesn't just walk into their pastor's office for counsel and sit down and say, you know, my marriage is falling apart or I'm just not sure what God's will is for my life or I'm just struggling with understanding the gospel. The pastor doesn't just hit them with the Bible and everything's well and every, they, their doctrine's perfect and their life is perfect. No. The scriptures need to be approached and studied and it takes discipline and it takes, it takes study and time and patience. As you, as you go to the scriptures to learn what they say. It's not something that just happens overnight. And it's not something that can just happen as you sit down over your glass of orange juice at breakfast and read three or four verses. We need to study the Bible. And so tonight I want to deal with some of those principles of how do we study the Bible. So some of the, some of the basic things that we need to talk about, we need to start with hermeneutics. So what, what is hermeneutics? Well, Sam Amati mentioned this a couple of weeks back in one of our episodes. Hermeneutics is the science of interpreting the scriptures. And everybody does them, no matter who they are, no matter if they are Christian or atheist, young or old, mature or simple-minded. Whoever approaches the text of scripture and opens it up and begins to read it, they are engaging in hermeneutics. They are engaging in interpretation. Now, certainly, some passages are more easily interpreted than others, and, and, and our hermeneutics are very subtle in those cases. For instance, the second, or, you know, any of the commandments, for that matter. You know, when we approach any of God's com commandments in the Ten Commandments, say, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's a fairly straightforward passage. There's not much interpretation that goes into it. If you know what adultery is, and you know what shalt not means, you know that this is something you should not be doing. It's something that God doesn't want you to do. There's not a lot of interpretation. And yet when we come to passages, for instance, like John the Baptist's claim when he sees Jesus Christ and he says, behold the Lamb of God, what does that mean? We have to interpret what that means. And again, if, if you're a Christian and you've read your, 
your scriptures, you know that John the Baptist is making a reference back to the Old Testament sacrificial system. He's, he's not just saying that Jesus is cute and cuddly and, and white and fuzzy like a little lamb. He's, he's saying that this is a lamb of God that comes to take away the sin of the world. This is the sacrifice. So we have to interpret. And anyone engaging in reading the Bible is doing hermeneutics. They're having an interpretation. Now the problem in our day where postmodernism reigns supreme is that many people come to the Bible, they don't do a serious study, they come to an interpretation, it's different than somebody else's interpretation, and they just come to the conclusion, well, to each his own. You have your interpretation, I have my interpretation, and we should just go on as, as, um, as, as, we, as we are, because everyone has approached the Bible for thousands of years, and no one has ever been able to understand it. There's all these interpretations that have always existed and so forth, and therefore that just means the Bible's unclear and we'll never be able to interpret it. Well, is that what it means? Is that the conclusion that we should come to? We really need to ask the question tonight, why are there so many different interpretations? And I think that the answer is really not that difficult. It has to deal with people and not with the text of Scripture. Just like 2 plus 2 equals 4, no matter how many people get the, the equation wrong and say that it equals 3 or 5, it's not that there's something flawed with the, the equation 2 plus 2 equals. It's the fact that people don't do the proper study necessary to get the right answer. And we see the same thing with the, when people approach the Bible. One of the common problems that we see, even in evangelical churches, is that people don't like to do serious study. They like to be spoon-fed by their pastors. And they come to church and they, they don't really do any study during the week and they hear the message and they feel edified and they feel like they've learned something and they go home and they try to apply it to their lives. Well, that works to some extent if you have an extremely godly, accurate pastor. But the fact is that, that even some of the best pastors tend to get things wrong sometimes. And especially this is dangerous in our age, where all you need to start a church is a handful of people and a name to put on a, a tax-exempt uh, certificate, that in this age anyone can get up and be a pastor, no ma regardless of, of their training or their calling to that, to that uh, discipline. And so we have people getting up and spoon-feeding people who don't want to read the scriptures, just a bunch of, of, of gobbledygook, basically. There's not a nicer way to put it. They're, they're feeding them stuff that is not true to the scriptures. This is one problem that we see. Another problem is we have people growing up not studying the scriptures. They're immersed in a particular culture that they have been, they have been raised in, and they, it's, it's no surprise that most children take on the religion of their parents. And the reason why is it's, it's fairly simple. It's nostalgic. This is our family. This is, this is what we enjoy. This is what we were raised in. These are our principles that we understand. And when you don't understand the scriptures, this tradition can, can shadow the true teaching of the Bible. It can obscure it. And you're caught up in tradition and you perpetuate it onto your children. So why do we have multiple interpretations of the Bible? For the most part, because nobody really seriously reads it. I mean, think about it in your own life. I mean, if you're an evangelical Christian and you claim to study the Bible, how often do you really study it? We all fall short in this area. But the, the fact is, is that we don't study it as much as we should. And that's, that's kind of what we want to get into tonight. Now, to those who don't want to study the Bible, we, I think this next quote that I have from A.W. Pink, who was a, a biblical scholar, is really illuminating and I think really touches on the central issue which we're dealing with tonight. A.W. Pink said this. He said, The Bible is not designed for lazy people. Truth has to be bought, but the slothful and the worldly-minded are not willing to pay the price required. That price is intimated in Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. There must be a diligent applying of the heart, a crying after knowledge, a seeking for an apprehension of spiritual things with an ardor and determination that men employ when seeking for silver, and a searching for deeper and fuller knowledge of the truth, such as men put forth when searching for hid treasures. If we would really understand the things of God, those who complain that these articles are too difficult or too deep for them do betray the sad state of their souls and reveal how little they really value truth. Otherwise, they would ask God to enable them to concentrate and reread these pages perseveringly until they made their contents their own. People are willing to work and study hard as long as, and long to master one of the arts and sciences. 
But where spiritual and eternal things are concerned, it is usually otherwise. We see that, the, that as Pink is, is putting his finger on, the problem is not in the scriptures. The problem is in people. The fact that this book is fairly long, the, the print is fairly small, it takes time, and in this, this age where we've got to get to soccer practice and we've got to get to work and we've got to do this and that, often the, our reading of the scriptures falls by the wayside. And that's a problem. We need to be disciplined in our study. But the emphasis that I want to draw from, from these analogies is the fact that the problem is not in the scriptures. In fact, Christian theologians throughout the centuries have emphasized the fact that the scriptures are perspicuous, which is somewhat of an ironic word because it's a word that nobody really knows what it means, except for theologians, but it means clear. So it's a word that's not very clear to people that means clear. But they, when they say the scriptures are perspicuous, they mean that they're clear. They can be understood. In fact, some of the most eminent people who have, who have written about the scriptures, say, for instance, the Puritans who put together the Westminster Confession, or the, the many evangelicals who gathered to write the Chicago Statement on Biblical Hermeneutics, expressed this fact. And I'd like to turn to those now. The Westminster Confession of Faith, Chapter 1, which deals with um, the text of scripture, has this to say. It says, all things in scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of Scripture or another that not only the learned but the unlearned, in a due use of ordinary means, may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. Now, a more recent document, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Hermeneutics, has this to say. It says, We affirm the clarity of Scripture and specifically of its message about salvation from sin. We deny that all passages of scripture are equally clear or have equal bearing on the message of redemption. So you can see what these, these men are saying. When we say the Bible is clear, we don't mean that every chapter and every verse is equally clear and anyone who comes to it and opens it up and just sincerely reads it will understand it. That's not what we're saying. There will be debates until Christ comes back about the true meaning of aspects of the book of Revelation or some fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. But what we say when we say the scriptures are perspicuous is that their central message is clear. The salvation of men from their own sins, things like who is God, who is man, who is Jesus Christ, what has he done, what is sin, what is salvation, and so forth, that these things are so clearly propounded in one place or another of scripture, as the Westminster Confession of Faith said, that not only the learned, not only the scholars, the people that go and get PhDs at Oxford in biblical interpretation, but the simple-minded man, the young child, that by applying a due use of ordinary means, they can come to an understanding of what the scriptures teach. Now it is these, these ordinary means which I'd like to talk about tonight because these are, these are what we employ when we deal with biblical hermeneutics, the interpretation of scripture. So most of these things are extremely common sense principles. And we employ them daily without even knowing it when we read a magazine or when we read a newspaper. They're not things that you have to go off and study for a master's degree to understand. Most of us can really grasp these basic concepts of hermeneutics, of proper interpretation and application. Now, the goal of hermeneutics is to bring about proper exegesis. Now, there's another big word that needs defining. Exegesis is a compound word that comes to us from the Greek language. And exegesis means literally to lead out or to bring out. So when we talk about exegeting a text, when, when you hear someone say exegesis or they're exegeting, what that, what that means is they open up the scriptures and they read it in context. They try to truly understand what it's saying and they try to bring the message out and understand what is it that Isaiah or Matthew or Paul is trying to say to me. That is the goal of hermeneutics. We want to truly understand what the scriptures say. Now the flip side, the opposite of exegesis is eisegesis. And you can probably guess what this means. It means reading in or leading into the text. And what this means is you come to the scriptures and we have our preconceived ideas of who is God, who is man, what is salvation, and so forth. And we read them into the text, that we twist the scriptures, that we put them in our box so that it fits what we already understand or think we understand. This is not Bible study. And this is something that we need to avoid as much as possible. We need to come to the scriptures and we need to realize that, that we have our presuppositions. 
that we have understandings that we bring to the text about who is God, who is man, what is sin, and so forth. We're men. We can't do away with any presuppositions. We're always going to have our baggage from our past. But what we need to recognize is that when we come to the scriptures, that we need to be cognizant of the fact that we do have that baggage, and we need to be ready to ditch it at any time that the scriptures disagree with what we think. Now, this is proper interpretation, proper exegesis. So how do we go about, about doing this? Well, one of those things I've already mentioned, and again, the Chicago Statement on Biblical uh, Hermeneutics brings this point to bear. It says there in, in, in the Chicago Statement that we affirm that any pre-understandings which the interpreter brings to Scripture should be in harmony with Scripture, scriptural teaching, and subject to correction by it. We deny that Scripture should be required to fit alien pre-understandings inconsistent with itself. So our understanding is to be that when we come to the Scriptures, we need to be ready to recognize that some of our presuppositional baggage may not be in accord with the Bible. And if that's the case, we need to be very careful about removing that baggage from us. So that, that is one of the first principles that we need to um, have in mind as we study. Now some other basic principles that we need to have as we study the Bible. One is prayer. We need to come to the scriptures and, and pray and plead with God to open our eyes and our ears. And it's not because the Bible is so difficult to understand that it, it would take nothing less than a supernatural miracle for us to understand it. That's not what we're getting at. Atheists can read the Bible and apply these basic hermeneutical principles which we're going to be talking about, and they can come to understand what it's teaching. They don't believe it, but they can come to understand what, what salvation is and so forth. And so we, when we come to God in prayer, we're asking Him to open our eyes, to, to prepare our hearts to receive this, to apply these teachings to our lives, to illumine them so that we can walk in these ways. It's not just some intellectual stimulation we're getting when we're reading the Bible. We're reading the words of God which are directly applicable to our lives. And we need to understand that and seek God in prayer. After we've, we've, we've sought the Lord in prayer, we need to come to the Bible and interpret it. Now, what scholars would say is we need to apply a grammatico-historical interpretation scheme to Scripture. And that's a really fancy way of saying something extremely simple and basic. It means when we come to the Bible, we need to look for the plain sense of the words. We look, we look at the, the grammatical construction. When Paul or Jesus or somebody says something, we take those words in their plain sense. We don't try to read in some type of allegory or some type of meaning that's absolutely foreign to those passages. Now, this doesn't mean that we, that we deny that there are figures of speech in the Bible or that there's metaphor or simile. This, this just means that we recognize when someone is using a, a figure of speech, we recognize it as such. When someone is making a, a, a plain statement, we recognize it as such. When there's poetry involved, we recognize it as such. So we, we read it in the plain sense of the, the proper genre of literature we're reading. And also, the historical element is that we, we look at it in, in its historical setting. Jesus was, was a man that lived at a particular point in history, and he was in a particular culture. And he was in particular situations when he said particular words. And so we need to recognize that fact, that there's a historical situation behind this which often illuminates our interpretation of a particular passage. So another element of this, this grammatico-historical interpretation scheme is that we let the author determine the meaning. We don't determine the meaning of the scripture. When we come to it and we read it, it doesn't matter how emotional it makes us and, and how we just feel about it. If, if what we feel is in conflict with what the author is trying to say, we need to, get, we need to be prepared to ditch our feelings. Because it doesn't matter how warm and fuzzy I get when I read a particular passage if I'm not reading it in the way that the Apostle Paul or whoever intended it to be read. The author determines his meaning. We discover it. Now we can see that there are some terrible examples of, of applying these principles that I've just talked about in some of the early church fathers. Now some of them were great and godly men, and some of the men that I'll be, I'll be talking about I respect very much. But in certain instances, you can see where they, they're not consistently applying these, these principles, and their interpretations are strange. So for instance, among the Alexandrian church fathers in the early centuries of the church, we find a man named Origen. And Origen was a very bright man, 
and did a lot of, of great work in terms of um, biblical scholarship. But when it came to interpreting certain passages, he applied it as very strange allegorical interpretation to a lot of things, which you, you can see some of the, the ridiculous results of this. So Origen, in commenting on the first chapter of Genesis, where God is talking about how he brought forth the sea creatures after their kind, Origen comments by saying this, speaking about the creation account, the great whales created in Genesis chapter 1 verse 21 represent impious thoughts and abominable understandings that we too should bring forth before God that he may assign them their place after their own kind. So Origen is saying that, that uh, the, the whales in Genesis 1 where in the creation account God is saying he's creating whales or sea creatures. Origen is saying these aren't really whales. We're to understand it that, that these whales are impious thoughts. And just as God brought them forth, we are to bring our impious thoughts forth. And just as God assigned them each after their own kind, God will assign our thoughts each after their own kind. And that, that you can understand. It doesn't take a scholar to understand that text has been completely twisted. That that meaning is completely foreign to the passage. Likewise, another great example of poor exegesis comes from Augustine. Now, I respect Augustine immensely. Augustine was one of the, the greatest intellects of the first century of the Christian church. In fact, most historians, even secular historians, will acknowledge that Augustine is probably the greatest intellect, or at least one of the, the greatest intellects of that first century AD. He was, a, he was a scholarly man. He wrote wonderful works, and I would encourage our audience tonight to read his Confessions, the Confessions of Augustine, talking about his, his personal conversion, and it's a beautiful um, devotional account of his salvation and the sovereignty of God in his life. But Augustine, in commenting on the parable of the Good Samaritan, so everyone knows this parable. This is the parable where Jesus is, is discussing with some of the teachers of the law, and it comes to a point where one of them asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? Because Jesus has just said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he, Jesus, goes in and gives this parable of the Good Samaritan, where a man is walking on this road, and robbers fall upon him, and they steal his belongings, and they beat him half to death, and they leave him for dead. And he's laying there on this road, and a priest walks by. And the priest walks by and just ignores the man. And that's kind of a strange thought. And likewise, a Levite walks by. So not quite as, as, uh, as wonderful as the priest. You know, the Levite wasn't as, as famous in the society. He did serve in the temple, but nothing like a priest. And he walks right by. And all of a sudden, a Samaritan comes by. And you have to remember that the, the Jews were not very fond of the Samaritans. They thought that they were heretics and people you shouldn't associate with. And this Samaritan picks up the man and, and, and pours oil and wine on his wounds and brings the man to an inn and, and pays the innkeeper and says, I will be back for him. Here's, here's some pay so that you can take care of him until I, be ba I get back. And this is Jesus is answering the man's original question, who is my neighbor? Now, Augustine takes the parable of the Good Samaritan in this way. He says this, The man who fell into the hands of robbers is Adam. Jerusalem is heaven, and Jericho signifies man's mortality. The robbers are the devil and his angels who stripped man of his immortality. In beating him, they persuaded him to sin, and in leaving him half dead, the devil and his angels have left man in a condition in which he has some knowledge of God, but is yet oppressed by sin. The priest represents the law, and the Levite represents the prophets. The Good Samaritan is Christ who, in bandaging the man's wounds, seeks to restrain sin. Oil is hope and wine is a fervent spirit. The man's donkey is Jesus' incarnation. And the man being placed on the donkey pictures himself in the incarnation of Christ. The inn is the church. The next day pictures the Lord's resurrection. The two coins represent either of the two precepts of love of this life and the life to come. The innkeeper is the Apostle Paul. Now, in respect to Augustine, would anyone coming to the parable of the Good Samaritan come to this conclusion? Now, he's saying things that are true. All of his doctrine within that, his understanding is true, that, that Christ comes and heals and so forth. But this parable is not designed to teach that. When that lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor, Christ is not trying to give a parable to explain how the innkeeper is the Apostle Paul. This is a completely foreign reading where, where Augustine is bringing a meaning into the text that is not what is intended by the author. 
So we need to be careful to, to look to what the author is saying in the historical context that he is speaking and also within the context of the words that we're reading on the page. So I want to emphasize, if you're going to take anything away from this episode, context is the word I want you to remember. Context. Context, context, context. This is the most important thing that we can understand when we come to the Bible. We need to read it in context. For instance, each word in Scripture comes within a sentence, and each sentence comes within a paragraph of Scripture, and each paragraph is a part of a larger portion of a book. And that book, that single book, finds itself in the place of the Bible. So we have, we have multiple levels of context that we need to be aware of. We need to be aware of the fact that these words were spoken in a particular context. Someone's trying to make an argument with Scripture. Matthew didn't just sit down and say, let's see, what can I write? I'm kind of bored today. He wrote for a particular reason, and therefore every verse that he writes is part of an argument that he's trying to get something across. We need to remember this, that there is context within the Scriptures. And one of the perennial problems of our day is the fact that somebody had the great idea to go through the Bible and to put chapter and verse divisions. And I'm thankful that they did that fact because it makes it so much easier on Sunday morning when your pastor is preaching from Romans chapter 7 that you can open up your Bible to Romans chapter 7 and you can read along. You know exactly where it is. Your pastor doesn't have to say, well, you see how there's three paragraphs there and then that, that third paragraph starts with therefore. Okay, now go, go, go down two sentences and that's where I am. We don't have to do that. We have, we have chapter and verse divisions. But we have to remember that chapter and verse divisions are not inspired. The Apostle Paul didn't sit down and say chapter 1, verse 1, and then begin one of his epistles. The chapter and verse divisions were put in later, and they are a helpful tool if you recognize that fact. But what happens too often is that people will take these individual verses, and they will isolate them from their context, and they will pull them out, and they will treat them like some kind of a Chinese proverb, and they will proof text doesn't matter if, if in the context that verse doesn't mean anything like what they're trying to say it means. They're happy because they've found a verse that kind of seems to say what they want to say if they take it out of context. We need to avoid that fact. We need to read everything in context. We need to read each verse in the context of the argument that's being made. And here are some, some examples. We'll start out with an extremely blatant one. So if you look at Psalm 14 in the Old Testament, the first verse of Psalm 14 it says, there's a, there's a sentence in there with quotes, there is no God. All right, so we might as well just close our Bibles and go home, right? Because there's no God. So there is no God who can breathe these words of Scripture. It says so right in the Bible. We shouldn't believe in God as Christians. Is that what Psalm 14, that particular sentence in, in verse 1 of Psalm 14 is teaching? Let's read it in context. Let's add in the few ver the words that were there. So here it is. There is no God. What does it say in context? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And that psalm goes on from there to explain how the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, and how they're in rebellion against God and so forth. And it fits the context of that psalm. But if we just lift out a sentence and say, well, see, this is what the Bible says, we can make its meaning completely opposite to what it actually is saying. And I had, I had this experience last night. Last night I had, I had the privilege to sit down with, with two LDS missionaries and talk about the gospel. And as the conversation got going, I explained who I am. I explained I'm, I'm not interested in, in joining your church, but I am interested in talking to you. And if you're willing to speak with me, then, then let's, let's, let's talk. And they sat down and I explained my view of scripture. I explained my high understanding that this is the inspired, authoritative, inerrant word of God. This is where I derive the principles of my religion from. I, I come to the scriptures and I say, what is God revealing about man, sin, himself, Jesus Christ, the church, all of these things. And I try to come to a holistic picture. And at first they agreed. They said, that's, that's wonderful. I'm glad that you have such a high view of scripture. But as the conversation progressed, I could see that they were getting somewhat uncomfortable with some of the verses which I was quoting to them and some of the things that I was sharing with them out of the Bible. And finally, one of the elders said, well, you're quite foolish to trust the Bible because the Bible says things which are so obviously wrong that everyone would recognize them as such. 
and you need a prophet to correct those errors. And I asked him, I said, can you please share with me a place in the scriptures where they say something so obviously wrong that anyone should recognize it? And he flipped open his Bible to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, and he read out of the King James Version the following verse. It says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And he slammed his Bible shut and he said, see, that's so wrong. It's telling us that we need to leave the principles of Christ and move on to perfection. That's, that's, that's teaching apostasy. That's so obviously wrong that I can't believe that you don't see that. And it's Joseph Smith who came in with the, the JST and corrected this verse so that now it reads, therefore leaving not the principles of Christ, of the doctrine of Christ. So we need a prophet because he can correct the errors. Well, is that what Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 is trying to say? That we should just apostatize, leave the doctrine of Christ, and go off and do whatever we want and press on to maturity? And I said, Elder, let's go back and read that in context. So going back to chapter 5, verse 12, we read together. It says, For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the, found, the, the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and of the eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. So in context, is Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 teaching us that we should apostatize and press on to maturity? No, if we look at it in context, the author to the Hebrews is rebuking the Hebrews because though by this point in time they should be teachers, they are still in need that someone should teach them. And he uses an analogy. He says, you should be eating strong you know, meat by now, but you're still in need of milk. You're untrained and unskilled. You don't have your senses discerned. And he pleads with them. He says, let's move on past the principles of Christ. Which principles? Go back up to the, to the, uh, beginning of, of, or the beginning of the section I read in chapter 5, verse 12. The first principles of the oracles of God. We're to press past these into maturity, not laying again these basic doctrines which you should have a grasp of, baptism and the resurrection of the dead and so forth. Press on to maturity, and this we will if God wills. So it's not teaching apostasy, it's teaching that we should progress. We should progress in our learning and so forth. And in fact, I pointed out that the King James is not even the most faithful representation of the original Greek. And that the NASB actually captures it better when it says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity. So you can see that it's brought out a little bit more clearly than the King James. So we need to look at things in context. That's the most important thing. Last night during family devotion, my wife and I were reading a book together, and the, the, the author, who I respect very much, to prove a point, quoted half a verse. This is the kind of practice we want to avoid. We want to call people back to, let's read this in context and understand. Well, before we press on tonight, I'd like to go ahead and open up the phone lines. This is something we haven't done in the past few episodes because of our guests. But if you'd like to call in and participate, our, our number here is 801-973-8820. That's 801-973-TV20. We'll try to get to all the calls that we can. So context is important. Now, before we move on, I'd like to take a call. We have with us Lori from Logan. Lori, you're on the air. It's good to have you with us. Hi, thanks. I have a question for you tonight. Okay. Speaking of taking things out of context and just wanting your take on things, if we could go to um, Luke 24, 32. Okay. And it says, And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened us to the scriptures? Right. So he's Does talking to the... Does that justify a burning in the bosom? And even just to pray to expect a burning in the bosom, would that be like a fleecing God, or, or what's your take on that? Right, so this is actually something I'm going to get into a little bit later. We need to realize that, that within Scripture there are narrative portions, and there are didactic portions. And the difference is narrative is it just explains the event as it is, and it says what people said. Didactic is a portion of Scripture which teaches something. 
that this is a doctrine that needs to be believed and so forth. So when we have the, the disciples um, there on, speaking with Christ on the road to Emmaus, this is not to be a standard for all people that truth is acquired based on how good you feel about it. Because the scriptures okay. clearly teach that that's false. That we, we, have, we have Jeremiah 17.9 talking about the, the deceitfulness of the heart and how wicked it is. And Proverbs 28 right. talking about... Is there anything that you know of in the scripture that warns against praying for, I mean, I know there's discernment of spirits and stuff, that warns against, I don't know, fleecing God? Yeah, so very clearly, um, we're not to test God. You know, we're not, we're not to come to him, and, and he is not some kind of a genie that we say, is this true? I think I'll ask you, and if I start feeling good about it afterwards, then I know it's true. And, and a perfect example of this is, is in... Um, is, is even in the temptation of Jesus with the devil. He tells him that, that I am not to tempt God. You know, the devil comes to him with a very simple, simple thing, that, it, well, if you're the Messiah, and God truly is, is uh, betting all on you, then you should be able to climb to the top of the temple and jump off. And when you don't die, when the angels come down, as he says in his scriptures, they will, and they save you and they set you down, you'll know for certain you'll be the Messiah. And he says, it is written, thou shalt not put the Lord their, your God to the test. See, the, the thing is, is that God has spoken. He has given us his truth. We need to read it and understand it. In Acts chapter 17, Paul comes to Berea. And we're told there that he preached the gospel to the Bereans. And these are people that haven't heard the gospel before. They're, they're probably familiar with the Old Testament and so forth. But what, what are we told there in Acts chapter 17? We're told that the Bereans were more noble than those at Thessalonica, for they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. The Apostle Paul brings them a message. And what do they do? Well, they don't just say, well, I'm going to pray about it and see how I feel, or, or I'm just going to think about what this means for my life, or, or, or some other type of test. They search the scriptures, and Paul commends them for that, because this is where truth is to be found. Now, there the are some... will verify itself. Right, right. And, and the Holy Spirit does bear witness with us, but it's, it's, not a, it's not a subjective burning in the bosom where we have this, this meter that we can, we can say, well, yeah, I know this is of the Spirit because I feel really good about it. It's, it's not what the Scriptures teach. The Scriptures teach, he who trusts in his heart is a fool, but the wise seeketh after wisdom. So we, 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 need, to, we need to remember that point. But, uh, okay, so you talked about praying, you know, for help and understanding. Right. Are there any, do you know of any scripture that specifically might deal with that? About, about praying for understanding? Right. I, I mean, it, it's just something that we see throughout scripture that, that, that we're to pray to God for wisdom and so forth. And so feelings are pretty much subject to change. Right, uh, so we're, we're not praying for feelings. We're praying that the Spirit would illuminate the text to us to help us understand it. Okay, because you're going to have feelings regardless of whether you pray or not, right? Right, and feelings aren't a bad thing. God has given us feelings for a reason. What we need to remember is we're fallen creatures, and our feelings are not the test of truth. Okay, thank you. Thanks for calling. So I want to press on a little bit. So we've talked about context. We need to look at a verse in context, and if you take anything away from today's uh, message. Take that away. Look at a text in context. Don't just pull fortune cookie verses out of the Bible. Read them in context. We had a, we had a, a man who served in the, the leadership of our church who, who had what he called the 2020 principle. Now this is, this is not something that I'm advocating for everyone. It's not some gimmick that if you employ it, you're going to understand the Bible. But it's a, it's a good idea. And what he said is that for any verse that he would read, he would read 20 verses above it and 20 verses after it to make sure that he's grasping the context. The, the, point, the whole point is, this, is that we try to grasp what the Bible is teaching us. So another thing that we need to look at is we need to look at the historical context. A lot of, a lot of the Bible, in fact all of the Bible, was not written in the 21st century. A lot of the Bible was written in the 1st century and a lot of the Bible, the Old Testament, was written well before the 1st century AD in a different cultural context than, than what we find ourselves in today. And so it, it's helpful to become somewhat familiar with this historical context before we seek to, to come to conclusions about the text. So a, a great example of this is in Exodus chapter 23, verse 19. 
We're given a command in Exodus chapter 23, verse 19, that you are not to boil a young goat in the milk of its mother. What does that mean? I mean, and if you think about it, without any historical background, you're going to think, well, that just kind of sounds mean to take milk from a mother goat and then boil her baby goat in it. That's maybe God is just trying to teach us to be nice to animals or to not, maybe it's just kind of an allegory for not being cruel in general. Well, if you have a grasp of the ancient Near East culture, you'll know that part of a Canaanite fertility ritual was to boil a, a, a young kid in its mother's milk, you know, a baby goat in its mother's milk. And this was supposed to, to bring fertility and, and blessing upon your crops and so forth. So when God is saying, don't boil a young goat in its mother's milk, he's not teaching something about that we need to be kind to animals, which is something we do see elsewhere. You know, we're not to be abusive with our dominion. But he's teaching them, don't be idolatrous. I mean, think of what happened just before Exodus chapter 23, back in Exodus chapter 20. He's given them the law. He's laid out, thou shalt have no other gods before me. He's laid out that idolatry is sin and it's not to be tolerated. And so it makes sense that when he, he, as, he's, as he's expounding on this, that he delves into some of the practical implications. So this doesn't mean that it would be a sin today for a Christian to boil a goat in its mother's milk, unless you're practicing some type of a Canaanite fertility ritual. Because that's what he's getting at. Don't commit idolatry. So if we, if we read it in the context of the history, it becomes much more clear. <clears throat> Likewise, when we see the plagues which God brings on Pharaoh in Egypt, we see these plagues, we see these frogs, and we see darkness, and we see disease, and we see the animals uh, dying, and we see that the Nile is turned to blood and so forth. What are we to take about this? What are we to understand? Well, if you, if you read it in the historical context, you'd know that each of those plagues is dealing with the specific Egyptian God, that God is showing his dominion and his sovereignty over the gods of Egypt, that they're no gods at all that this Pharaoh with his mighty kingdom and his gods is nothing in the hands of the true creator of the universe. That they had their god of the sun, Ra, which is the, the, the main god of, of Egypt, Egypt for, for most of its history. And yet, God brings darkness, blots out the sun, just as Moses said he would. That, there, that, that, that when we understand the historical context, we can understand the scripture. Likewise, when we see Jesus performing feet washing and he tells his disciples that you're to wash one another's feet, how many of you have washed another's feet in that context? Probably not most of us. But when we recognize the historical context that it's in, the historical cultural practices of first century Palestine, we can then draw from it what he's trying to say. What is it that he's trying to say? Is it he's trying to say that we should keep each other's feet hygiene up to par? Or is he saying that we need to humble ourselves before our brothers? Which seems to fit the context of John chapter 13. So historical context is important. Likewise, when we come to John 3.16, it's one of the most loved, and it's also one of the most abused texts of Scripture. For God so loved the world. You know, we see it printed on plaques and precious moments, dolls and everything, and everyone just thinks this verse is so wonderful that God loves everybody equally. Is that what it's teaching? Well, you say, well, it's ridiculous. He says he loves the world. What would a first century Jew understand when he reads John 3.16 or a Gentile at that time period? They're going to understand, wait a second. God loves us too. He's not just the God of the Jews, but he is the God of the whole world, that he sent his son to die for the sins of the world, that all who call on his name will not perish. This is a revolutionary concept to a first century Jew who was looking for a Messiah to come establish an earthly kingdom and crush all the nations. And here we're seeing that the Messiah is dying for these nations which need to be crushed. I mean, read the book of Acts. Th this concept of the Gentiles being brought into the church is not something that appears until Acts chapter 10. And Peter is astounded. He can't believe that this is something that God is doing and he's amazed. It's because it wasn't even thought of even though we take it for granted now that God would send his Messiah to die for Gentiles. So we need to read things in their historical context. Before we press on, I'd like to take some phone calls. We have with us John from Murray. John, it's good to have you with us. Hello? Hi. Yeah, this is John. Sorry, um, what was your name? I didn't catch it. Matt. It's Matt. It's Matt? Yeah. All right. Um, you know, I think it's interesting you're talking about keeping things in, in context in the Bible. Right. 
Um, my first question, I guess, for you is, uh, do you believe in the Trinity? I do, yes. Okay. And I guess, wh where do you find that taught in the Bible? Right. So the Trinity is, is based upon three basic principles, which people can understand when they come to the Scriptures. The first principle, and the most important, and I think the most obvious, is that there's one God. I mean, you read Isaiah chapter 40 through 50, just over and over, that there is one God, there is no God before me, I am the Alpha and the Omega, there will be no God after me, there is no God beside me, I know not any. We have uh, 1 Timothy teaching that, that God is the infinite, eternal, invisible, the only true God, and so forth. So we have the teaching, and since we only have a few minutes, that, that there is one God. Okay. We, we, have well, the t we have the teaching that there are... Do you believe you're reading uh, the Isaiah chapters in their full context? I do, yes. Okay. Well, what do, you, what do you think about the idol God that it talks about just after each of those verses? Right. So, so the, the whole purpose of Isaiah, those Isaiah chapters, is Isaiah, Isaiah's prophecy is directed against idolaters. And he's saying that his, his whole point is that these idols are no gods because there is only one God. It's not that there is one God and then there's other gods. He's saying, you know, he's, he's mocking these idols and he's saying, prophesy idols, tell us the future, tell us the things that I have brought about from old and so forth. Oh, well, he says, before me there was no God formed, but what kind of gods is he referring to? He's referring to God in general. I mean, you think no, about the concept. Said, he says, before me there was no God right. formed. Right, and neither shall there, no, be, there after be after me. me. But we get the context. If you read it in context, for example, uh, if you go to chapter 44, right. uh, he says, Is there a God, be this is verse 8, Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, I know not any. Right, there is he no God He did make a graven me. image, are all of them vanity, and their, detect their, their delectable things shall not profit. Right, so um, he, is, he is... I don't see any context for God speaking of any gods in heaven. I just see idols here. It's uh, the, it's the, no the whole point of him saying that these idols are no gods exactly. so is that's that the there context. is only one He's God. Speaking. He's saying that there is only one God, that there is, there is none before me, there is none after me, there is none beside me, that I am the only God. He, he brings out his uniqueness in that chapter. Well, well then, then you have to explain the rest of the Bible that talks about the plurality of gods. Like where, for instance? Uh, Psalms 82. Right, so Jesus in, it quotes Psalm 82 to the Pharisees, and he, it, they, they charge him with being, saying that, that, you, that you're a god. You know, you've made yourself to be a god. And he says to them, um, you know, do you're not, the scriptures cannot be broken. Do, does it not say that ye are gods? Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting that, that nobody ever notices, seems to notice the fact, the people that are trying to advocate there's more than one god, they don't notice sure. the fact that the Jews but get... We believe there's a council of gods. Okay, so, so that, let's, look, let's that talk here for a second. our God is the highest of all the gods. Let's talk here for a second. The Jews get extremely angry at him for saying this. And why is it that they get angry? Is it because they're tr trying not to recognize the fact that the scriptures teach that there are multiple gods? It's because Psalm 82, if you go back and read Psalm 82, is speaking about the judges of men. And it's talking about that that, you know, ye are as gods, and yet ye shall die as mere men. God is mocking the judges I mean, of I mean, Israel. I that, mean, that's one interpretation that it's speaking of men. But, but it says that. It says ye are a lot gods. Of scholarly work actually doesn't support that. Why, if you read in Psalms 82, uh, let's see, verse 7, he says, ye are gods. Right. And, and you are the children of the Most High. Right. But ye shall die like men. Exactly. Why would... Why would God condemn men to die like men? Uh, he's speaking to these judges of Israel. He's speaking to these judges of Israel, and he's saying that, that ye are as gods. Ye are in my place, that ye are ruling over the people. You are, you are imposing my law upon the people, but you're corrupt, and you're going to die like mere men. And so well, this is why they were already men. Why would they die like men if they're already men? They're already going to die like right. men. Right. I would encourage everyone well, to read no Psalm 82. Okay. They're receiving what they're already going to receive. Exactly. God Thinking is mocking about them. about divine beings that are immortal. God is mocking them. are going them to receive in their idolatry. of mortality. So John, um, he, he's, he's mocking them in their, in their vanity. I, the Bible is full of plurality of gods. All right, For let's, example, let's, let's go to Genesis 3. Right. Uh, uh, let's see. This is the devil speaking to Eve. 
He said, "Ye shall be um, as gods." Yeah, ye shall it's, be it's, as gods. Right. And then Genesis chapter three also, God confirms that. He says, "They've uh, become like one of us." It. Right. I, I I understand that, but that is not teaching that there is there is a multitude of gods in the heaven. Oh, sure. I mean, and that's only the beginning. I mean, there's numerous scriptures that talk about the plurality of gods. The scriptures... And then, and then Isaiah. John, John. Take Isaiah, but John, take that out of context. John. Exactly against what you were teaching. To John, we only have a, a second left, and I, I'm going to have to hang up if, if, if we can't have this conversation. Okay. The Bible, well, I mean, I just wanted to point out that you're not reading Isaiah in context. John, I would encourage you to, to read uh, Isaiah's whole argument. for gods, not other gods. Isaiah's whole argument is that there is only one God. There is no other God. You can go to Paul. He teaches there's exactly. one God. Jesus. I, I totally agree with you. It is talking about one God. Number one, it's the God of this world, not the God of the whole universe. John, you're bringing to the Scripture your own understanding and forcing it upon the text of the Bible. I don't know. He says the God of Israel. It doesn't say the God of all other right. planets. Right. He's, he's, he's identifying himself with his people. He is the God who created the heavens and the earth. I there, know. And this world, it doesn't, it's not talking about other worlds. He's the God who has created the universe. Uh, anyway, we only well, have 30 seconds left, John. If that. you want to continue this conversation, call back after the program and we can talk about it. Thanks for calling. Okay. I just want to make it clear. This is, a, this is a perfect example of the fact that we need to go back to the scriptures and we need to bring out the meaning that's there. Again, I want to I thank you for watching. There's so much more we could talk about. Context. Thanks for watching.